wonderful to be with you. I know many of you, but not all, which is great to see at a new space, new worlds conference. Rick, I have known for longer than he would probably want to admit. This is probably a case of him being more concerned about his age than me. But we have um, the whole world, as we say, the new worlds um, is something that I love following um, Kim speaking because I too came to the space world in a different way. And what I want to talk to you about is primarily uh, NASA related because that is what I am most known for was my time at NASA and some of what we achieved there. But I want to talk about it in a sense of how it fits together with new worlds and humanity reaching out into space because I did get my start very early at the National Space Society in 1984. Um, I worked there for 13 years before going to NASA the first time. My master's degree is in science, technology, and public policy, space policy. So uh, also not an engineer scientist like some of the other speakers this morning. And I think it is that perspective and the perspective of groups like this that um, have really made the most meaningful changes for us all. So I'll go through some of these slides quickly because frankly I came from speaking day before yesterday at the Air Force Academy, a similar talk trying to help cadets see the bigger picture for space. Space Force is now something at the Air Force Academy you can choose, uh, sort of like the Marines, to be a part of and hoping to shape those um, thoughts to have them recognize we're you know, hoping to wage peaceful exploration. Um, but I will start with that early history of NASA. Most of you know this, but I, I, do, I do love that I am one of the older people here finally. It seemed like forever I was at space conferences with old people. But um, early in NASA's history, you can imagine that we began in the Cold War. And my point from this is that we really did, because of that, shape not only what we did, but how we did it. And that was very self-reinforcing of who wanted to be involved. So in the early days, you saw these military white men doing these heroic things. Well, I'm, I'm just a little older than Jeff Bezos, and I grew up in Apollo not paying much attention to it, where he talks about how that was his inspiration for his life. I believe much of that is because those people look like him, and there was no one for me to really relate to. We attracted that talent pool, and we built up an infrastructure that NASA has had to carry around since the Apollo days, but without Apollo-sized budgets. So just a quick look at where NASA has come. This is typically used to show how NASA doesn't have much money. In my view, this shows we still have a lot of money in our US uh, civil space program. So the peak there of Apollo came awfully quickly and it allowed us to achieve a miraculous goal. But we have been pretty steadily at about half the purchasing power of Apollo without that mandate to go to the moon, right? We said on um, the first chart, I didn't note it, but we had we were sort of dressed up with nowhere to go. We built this infrastructure, we had this capability, um, and then we didn't have a purpose for it, but we had all the buildings uh, that needed uh, to continue to be utilized. When you think about the United States space program, we love to be concerned that we're in a war with China or something, but guess what? We're still the big dog, okay? This is combined military and civil budgets. They're about $40 billion. This is dated, so it's a little more than that now. But the relative to other nations, the United States is still very much a leader. If you say, well, that included defense, much more of it is defense than civil. It's not true. Most of the spending of our nation uh, on space is in civil program. We, however, have uh, closer to a 50% share than most. You can see here the US, Russia, and China have um, the balance where we spend quite a bit on the military 
use. This is another way to look at it. And geographically, if you think about, you know, space is the most global thing. We've talked a lot about that today already, right? That we do. But look at the different parts of the world and who is spending money in space. North America, Canada's just a little thing there. It's mostly the United States. Um, but there are whole regions of the planet that aren't spending much, at least of their government funds, on it. And I think, again, this is based on sort of the way we began as this Cold War, us versus Russia, now China's in there. Um, and I think breaking out of that, as Rick said this morning, starting uh, the future is now. Um, I do note that as a percentage of GDP, our lead is not as strong. So the US is still, has a higher percentage of their GDP uh, than any other nations, but we, it, it isn't relatively as much of a lead. And I think this is where you get people, you know, the aerospace contractors in particular yearn for those days when we were, I think at, at one point, nearly 6% of the GDP of the country. So what does NASA do with this money? This is from last year's budget, 21, and the purple shaded is human spaceflight. So you've got the lighter purple that is the International Space Station and the transportation, space operations, exploration being the darker purple. We still spend about 25, 30% of our budget on space science, and these are sort of unique missions. I'll, I'll talk a little more about, we'll go through them quickly. Aeronautics is a tiny sliver, technology, and the light blue is like that infrastructure that we're, um, they do support all the missions. So one of the things that our early program drove is the types of people we flew. With NASA spending half its budget on human spaceflight and being the biggest dog in the game, we have certainly sent the most people into space, and the blue bar is men and the red bar is women. Uh, in this chart at the Air Force Academy, like, wow, we're doing better in other countries. <laughs> you, I, okay, fair enough. Um, but we are 50% of the population, so we got work to do there. Um, over time, even the U.S., other than the last couple of years where we were flying on the Russian space um, uh, Soyuz vehicle, we have had most people flying to space with us. So on the blue here, that's good old US of A. We flew a lot of people on the space shuttle. Um, I'm gonna say some bad things about the space shuttle, so let's just bask in that. We flew a lot of people to do a lot of different things on the space shuttle. Someone else talked about this this morning. The space shuttle, you know, is near and dear to many people, and to NASA it is iconic. Actually, to the world it's pretty iconic. But it was a, a failed vehicle in the sense that it, it, its whole purpose was to lower the cost of space transportation, and it did not do that. It was to be safe and reliable, and it was not. We lost. 14 astronauts on this vehicle and after 30 years retired it without having lowered the cost of space transportation. Um, it did do some great things. It did launch satellites, which frankly, you know, we didn't need astronauts to do and that policy was changed. But the biggest thing it did with its last 33 missions, oh, here's a crew. I think this must have been, yep, is after Challenger, you can always tell why the pressure suits. We didn't even have them in pressure suits before Challenger. It was going to be a shirt sleeve environment. Uh, we built the space station with 33 shuttle flights. And the space station, I'm going to say, is another program that really has not lived up to its expectations in the sense that President Reagan announced it in 1984, it was gonna cost $8 billion, it was gonna be here in 10 years. After 10 years and twice that much money, we didn't have a thing to show for it, but we reached out to the Russians in the 1990s. This was what happened while my first tour at NASA in the 1990s. 14 nations um, weren't all thrilled to include Russia in the space station, 
but that did allow us to get their early hardware. It did allow us to have separate access to the space station with a Soyuz that saved us later. Um, but I think today, if you look diplomatically, did having the Russians come during perestroika, the whole concept was we were going to turn, you know, plow, uh, swords to plowshares and try and get people who were working in the military technical fields to come work in civil space. Um, here we are, and we're, um, you know, basically at war with Russia again. Uh, space has been this beacon, as we talked about this morning. We've got people on the space station, cosmonauts and astronauts living and working together in a very close relationship, but that has not translated to us here. And I think as part of my overall uh, work ha has been to try and get NASA to loosen its grip and see, yes, we do amazing things, but the whole point is how that connects to everyone else. And we needed to, I think, do a better job of conveying the value of that relationship before now, here we are just kicking everyone out of each other's countries. The space station is a shirt sleeve environment. This is Kibo Lab, for, uh, for instance, Japanese laboratory, where again, Reagan said we're going to be solving you know, the mysteries of the universe. We are going to be making new materials and medicines in space that are going to profit you know, the nation. That has not happened yet. We have had 20 years of living and working together. We have had a lot of experience both working in microgravity in the interior uh, environment and with these EVAs where, as we talk about things now going forward, needing to have fuel depots and construction in space, we have learned a tremendous amount. So like shuttles, sort of a mixed bag. What I think is going to in many ways, maybe be the biggest benefit of the space station, however, was serving as the destination for a reliable space transportation system. Again, this was what the space shuttle was supposed to be. This is a dragon. Now we are doing it. We do have the ability, as Dennis Stone said earlier, we're just buying seats. NASA's buying seats on the dragon in order to go to space station. And we are taking people from a greater variety of backgrounds, and that is all changing really at a, at a pace that's very exciting today. Beyond human spaceflight, again, big leader. USA has more satellites, and this was 2020, so we have more than 1,500. We've doubled since then um, with Starlink. NASA's space science program, which again, it's 25 to 30% of the budget, which today means that's around $8 billion. The planetary science gets a lot of attention. We are the nation that just in the little box down there, how many missions to Mars uh, we have had. NASA has a success rate like, like none other, and we have learned a tremendous amount and are continuing to every day with our well-named rovers and now a helicopter. But we also have a program, it was one of my favorites, was, we called it Living with a Star back in the day, but it's known as heliophysics. Everything about our planet and our relationship to the sun, our star, is meaningful and we must understand it, not only to live here, but to go further. NASA's heliophysics department actually has provided a tremendous amount of, of, of knowledge for us and how we operate in space. Astrophysics, we've gotten a lot of, uh, you know, good public attention around the Webb telescope. Someone's on the stage said it costs 20 billion. That is the first time I've ever heard someone say it costs more than it did. Uh, we go with 11 billion, but keep in mind it was supposed to be 500 million when it was um, proposed. I was at NASA in the 1990s when Webb was proposed, and I, um, I wasn't there when we launched it. I was there when we were supposed to launch it for a whole bunch of years. Nevertheless, these missions, they are either operational or in the planning phases to study 
the universe. I mean, just, I don't know. Think about any time that you could have lived in your life. And if you're like me, your grandparents or parents saw a lot of change. You know, they did see the first airplane. Um, in my case, my grandfather, the first car. Um, but we live in a time when we are seeing the, the past deep into space, when we are understanding uh, how we exist in our own uh, universe. We also have eyes on our own planet. Of NASA's science budget, $8 billion, $2 billion is spent on Earth observations. These missions, and, and a lot of the other nations that are listed who did so much for, um, do uh, less than us, but most of what they focus on are Earth Sciences missions. As you can imagine, you know, the nearly 8 billion people here um, need to understand, and Rick talked about it a little this morning, the unique perspective from space is what has allowed us to understand our changing world and the interactions of the measurements that we take from satellites on the, you know, the ice, the oceans, the atmosphere, and the land are what are giving us the ability to predict for adaptation, to keep, you know, to limit the human suffering that is already happening and that will continue and get worse if we don't do something about it. So again, living at a time when, yes, we have made mistakes as humanity and we have driven ourselves potentially to extinction, but we live in a time when we can do something about it. And that is the piece to understand. So when you work at NASA, you sort of have to think about the value proposition because you are asking taxpayers to give their, um, their own hard-earned money to have the government do something. And I took that very seriously. I've been at NASA about 10 years over my two tours. And I'm not going to tick through these some this morning because of blah, 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 blah. Yeah, these are the reasons, blah, 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 blah. But they do, for many people, um, I think, have great meaning. We will, for here, focus on that last one, right? This is a little bit self-explanatory. Um, even if there weren't climate change, you know, we know that, for instance, the dinosaurs didn't last forever, although they had a very good run. Um, as a single planet species, we are destined to um, fail if we do not expand. And exploration is only the beginning um, to expansion via settlement. So I come into NASA. I've learned a lot the first five years I'm there working for Dan Golden. And I feel like in 2008, a lot has changed. There's a lot more investment in the um, new rockets that can really lower the cost. We've already determined, President Bush said it, Obama gets tagged with it a lot, but it's Bush who said we're gonna end the space shuttle program. We fully agreed. But being able to replace the space shuttle at, um, with something that wasn't going to be developed by NASA, and therefore, again, you've got to then carry all these infrastructure costs. We were very focused on having a competition to do that. In those early years, the 1990s, this was begun at NASA. So I was surprised it was so controversial um, 10 years later when Dan Golden, as head of NASA, put in place the X-33 program. We had the DCX. Um, the winner of the X-33 program was Lockheed Martin, and they were doing the Venture Star program. The whole reason that failed is the technology was pushed and the markets collapsed at the time where we had the, um, you know, the bubble burst in the um, dot-com world. That was going to be their market that carried them and made their business plans close. We in the United States went down to a single monopoly provider of launch services. The United Launch Alliance comes to the government, Boeing and Lockheed, and says, we've got a deal for you. We will launch everything you need, and the government bought it. This was, I think, you know, we can say now it was helpful because they ended up charging so much that created an opportunity for 
someone else to come and exceed. So the era of transformation where the government didn't design and develop and operate its own vehicles came in, as Dennis Stone said, with cargo first in 2006. I came back in 2008. I was able to, with great uh, difficulty, manage to get some investment into what became known as the commercial crew program. We did this initially through what, what was known at the time as the stimulus budget, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. I was able to use sort of a loophole in the system because I ran transition team for NASA in 2008 and 2009, and we were able, because of the recession, to put in um, money to start this program without having the full congressional vetting. Um, I asked for more. I really wanted to just put in COTS D and let SpaceX go ahead and run with it. And if we'd done that, I think we could have had the crew dragon quite a bit earlier. But we managed to get our foot in the door. Um, we also managed to do suborbital research. We quadrupled the budget for those programs and initially started the policy that allowed researchers to go with their vehicles, because this has had been the big thing NASA didn't want to do in case you know someone got hurt. So I took being appointed the deputy of NASA very seriously. For someone who grew up the way I did, which I'll get to in just a little second, it, it took, I thought, something that I was willing to take a stand on, having grown up in the space community with the National Space Society, having spent five years at NASA in the 1990s when we were trying to reduce the cost of space transportation. And we came forward with a number of goals in the Obama administration for NASA. Again, I won't go through it. The takeaway being, if you're trying to do something in government that is sort of bucking the status quo, those established institutional interests, and in many cases, these were you know people's livelihoods, understandably, had built up around, for instance, charging $400 million for a launch. Um, you know, those of us in this community think, oh, you know, those, they're just, you know, stealing. And the truth is those were people's jobs. And so it was very difficult to expand um, what, what I knew would be an expansion of space because first people were worried about the contraction. You want to be responsible, again, if you're spending tax dollars to the public. And there's a couple of these surveys that ask the public what their priority would be for NASA. And the number one is always adapting to climate change, studying the Earth from space. Understandable. This is where we live today. Um, interestingly for me, the monitoring um, and tracking of asteroids is number two. And again, these are consistent over time. And I think the DART mission the other day sort of reinforced that. You see at the bottom, the very bottom, is sending an astronaut to the moon, and second from the bottom is sending an astronaut to Mars. So why am I showing you this chart? I think we have to keep in perspective that the prioritization for our government programs need to, in some ways, be reflective of the public. But the reason I focused on lowering the cost of space transportation is because everything on this chart requires you to have access, requires you to get there. And we are very lucky today that we have some individuals who have been willing to risk their own funds to take advantage of the policies we put in place. I mean, we say, you know, we have a symbiotic relationship. I needed them to succeed. They needed me to succeed as well. I say here that this did not start with me or Jeff or Elon. Because that is 100% true. Not only was NASA trying to do this in the 1990s, in the 1980s when we had the movement that Rick was talking about, um, this is where I learned it. Everybody there recognized that, I think it's a Highline quote, you know, when you get to orbit, you're halfway to anywhere. You've got to get off the planet. Um, to me, space is very similar, and we're living in a time that would be analogous to when you were first crossing the ocean. We first had the capability 
to sail or to fly in the atmosphere. We have the capability to go to space for the first time and just like on the sea and in the sky, there are going to be new um, vehicles created. They're hopefully gonna get safer each time. They're gonna get uh, cheaper and they are lowering the barrier to us doing everything else that we have wanted to do in space. There are many reasons in a bureaucracy like NASA that ways that you can try and keep that as the goal, and that was sort of my objective. That brings us up to today where we are. We have Artemis. You all know what Artemis is. I don't think most of the public does, but that's probably okay for now. Sister of Apollo, wonderful name. I don't buy the 2024 we're, we're going to land. I think we even say now, doesn't Administrator Senator Nelson say 2025 for landing? But the point is, I really do believe that after Apollo, there have been a handful, half a dozen, attempts to explore again and go back to the moon sustainably. And I believe that Artemis has the potential to actually do that. Not in the way that they, they plan, in, in my view. And um, we can talk about that as well. But my, um, Right now, I don't think Artemis, I don't think SLS is on the pad. I think it's in the garage still. When it gets out there again, it might go, it might succeed. I think that the SLS and Orion will get a flight or two. I'm always asked this how many flights, I have no idea, but it depends on Starship because when NASA selected Starship as their lunar lander, they gave their own architecture the ability to be sustainable. And it is going to be quite a year, I will say, come back next year and we'll have a much better sense of where all this is going. The next, these are the big questions. You know, what will happen to the um, Artemis program? I think it has sustained for a couple of administrations, which is nice to see. We have the ability to use that, I think, fairly large percentage of, of NASA budget to do this. And we even have, I think, an interest now, at least with many of the people at NASA, to use those funds in a leveraged way that allow us to go back and stay and go further. Um, again, I don't think SLS Orion are gonna be the vehicles to do it. But if you look at commercial crew, I just have to give one more plug here because before commercial crew, the only human spaceflight programs we had had since Apollo were the space shuttle and the space station. Both were estimated to cost $8 billion to develop and tripled, quadrupled in size. We spent over time around $150 billion on the space shuttle program, another $200 billion on the space station program. My quick math shows that's about a billion dollars per astronaut. You don't really need to think very hard through that math to recognize that's not sustainable. Not many of us are gonna get to go if that's the cost. Commercial crew was set at $6 billion. We were supposed to get that over the first five years. It took us nine years to get that but we were supposed to get two systems from it. Less than half of that went into getting us the Crew Dragon. An order of magnitude less than any previous human spaceflight program that NASA had been involved with before. This is what I outlined in my book, Escaping Gravity, as was mentioned. Uh, do not tell my publicist I came here and talked to you without a book. I don't even have a booth to sell books. You can get them everywhere if you haven't. Um, the reason I wrote the book is because I did come from, I think, a different upbringing and background than most, and I think that is what allowed me to achieve what I did at NASA. So this is me being held by my grandfather who was in the state legislature in Michigan. As I say in the book, I was campaigning before I could walk. He used to carry me in parades. And he and my uncle together over 40 years held a seat in the middle of Michigan. They're Republicans and they, um, entered public service to give back to their fellow farmers. This was my heritage. 
Me and my sister? Sure. This is the one thing. I can't believe my mom has this picture. I told you I don't really remember too much. I remember those matching dresses. That is what I remember. But obviously, the world cared. Um, but my start when I got out of college was I worked for Senator John Glenn. This was my, Kim talked about, you know, coming to it late. I came to it late as well. But working for John Glenn was the perfect entry point for me. Um, there's Sally Ride with me. These are two space heroes that were mentors of mine that got me in the business. My first time I went to NASA, I was not a political appointee, but when the head of NASA asked me to lead the policy office, that was a political job and it was in the Clinton administration. So I've worked for uh, President Clinton and then I went off because I was a political appointee, I had to leave in 2001, but I went with a client who I finally get to name in, in the book because I asked him and he said that was fine. Fisk Johnson was, um, he's the CEO of SC Johnson Wax. He was paying for a ride for himself to go to space, but after 9-11, his business needed him back. We'd negotiated a really low price for the seat, and so I began training for it and getting sponsors. An agent found out that Lance that, that this was a business model that might work, he saw in a chat room that Lance Bass had um, told in response to a question about what he would have been if he weren't in a band, um, that he wanted to be an astronaut. And so he faxed, this is all wonderfully dated kind of thing, Lance, an invitation from the Russians to fly in space. Lance shows up in Russia to train for this mission. He thought he was invited. Um, all a very entrepreneurial agent. It didn't work out for either of us. I tell the story in the book, and I was Astro Mom versus the boy band, and we had a blast in Russia for a while training. Being confirmed by the U.S. Senate for the job I had in NASA with Charlie Bolden, I discuss this a lot in the book. Being the deputy to an administrator, um, Charlie is a wonderful person. We had very different policy views and a lot of the progress we made um, was made more challenging because we had someone in the administrator position who had come from the traditional background. He'd gone to the Naval Academy, gone to test flight school, he was an astronaut, um, and he didn't think NASA needed to change in any way. I took it on. This is the last shuttle landing, I'm sitting here arguing with the commander of the mission right after landing. I can't believe NASA got this shot, me and Chris, Chris Ferguson. The takeaway though is Chris Ferguson went and worked for Boeing on commercial crew. A lot of these people who were opposed to this are doing it now. For me, it took a lot of people who, um, well you'll recognize here, Bob Cabana is now number two at NASA, Neil Tyson, um, Eric Anderson, Ed Liu, Bill Nye, the science guy. This was when the president came to the Kennedy Space Center and announced that he, he was going to try and get more support for his proposal for a commercial crew. That was really his number one objective. And I guess for, for my um, conclusion would be it took, like, if you think of these people, they're all, they were critical to making this happen. Um, it's changed everything, and I agree. I don't have a Starship slide in here because I, I truly believe that's still, you know, something. It's if Starship becomes operational, everything will change. Dragon. Commercial crew, commercial cargo changed a lot, but Starship is something entirely different. And it takes a broad range of people bringing up. I don't agree with Rick that we don't have a movement anymore. I think we are a movement. You all are in it. I could never, I wouldn't have learned what I did without uh, the community, and we all need you in um, the future. My. Uh, Q&A session is upstairs at lunch. They don't uh, take questions here, but I think the, the plan and the reason I didn't go into it too much here is we'll get into some of the, I don't know if it's politics versus, 
you know, just the, me and Rick tell, telling old war stories at lunch. So that's my pitch for you to make the transition to lunch. Again, I really appreciate all of you being here, being able to share that there is progress and that I think the future of space is bright. Thank you very much. Thank you.